name is State Senator John Petrick. I represent uh, 30 towns and townships in western and northern Oxford County and the town of Jay in Franklin County. Thank you, Senator Patrick. This is Joyce Maker. I'm Joyce Maker. I represent District 31. I am co-chair. Uh, Senator Sherman. Uh, Good morning. I'm Lock Kiermaier, staff for the Maine Citizen Trade Policy Commission. Um, and I'm here to also introduce um, the primary speaker for this public hearing, um, Professor Bob Stumberg. Um, Bob is a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center and is the director of the Harrison Institute for Public Law. Um, for anyone, for members of the commission to remind you and anyone in the audience or anyone listening to just give you a brief background on the purpose of this public hearing and how it came to be. Current Maine law requires that the Maine Citizen Trade Policy Commission conduct an assessment of foreign trade policy every once every two years. And um, the legislature provides a certain amount of money by which you can accomplish that assessment. Professor Stumberg. And welcome, and welcome. Professor Stumberg. Thank you very much. It's quite a pleasure to be here on this beautiful summer day. Before I dive into the three presentations I've organized for you, uh, Locke thought it might be interesting or useful to give a broader overview because it can get pretty technical, so we thought that a general overview might be useful. And actually, from most of this assessment is focused on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, and as you probably know, about four of the chapters have been leaked, so we, we see drafts, but those are drafts that are months, if not a year or older. Um, the other chapters have not been released yet, so I'm referring to the models from which the negotiators are working. For example, the most recent free trade agreements in the United States or Australia or New Zealand. So let me start with my overview of trade policy, if, if this is uh, F and H. Um, I'd like to talk briefly about how trade policy affects government power. And here the big, the big observation is that we're not talking about trade policy the way most humans think about the word. For the most part, I'm not talking about tariffs. I'm not talking about treaties that actually are working to liberalize or improve trade. I'm talking about provisions of treaties that are designed to work like a constitution to limit the power of government. And you may think internationally in, in, in Washington, D.C., because whether you know it or not, the work of this commission is, is uh, widely spread and greatly appreciated. And finally, I'll, I have a few themes to help you focus on some of the more interesting parts of the uh, subsequent presentations. So trade policy has evolved. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I won't go back to the Roman Empire, which was arguably one of the most successful and early free trade zones. It was established by military conquest, as you all know, and the, the fruit of victory was trade. And the Romans exploited it, and then they taxed the hell out of it, and it made them rich. Um, and ever since, people have noticed that, that that formula seems to work. And I guess the, in the biggest picture of all, they the evolutionary progress people have made as a species is, is that we're no longer so much, I say so much, using military conquest, we're re resorting to commercial conquest as the, uh, as the uh, weapon of choice. Uh, let's start with the U.S. Constitution, which created one of the most successful free trade zones in the history of the planet by linking together a continental a confederation of states, uh, the more perfect union, which was founded on free trade principles, principles of non-discrimination among the states themselves, and limits on state power um, to keep states from using their lawmaking sovereignty to discriminate against trade from other neighboring states or other countries. That was a big deal, and it's part of the success of the United States as a whole. Um, flash forward to the period right after World War II, uh, the so-called Bretton Woods Agreements and the creation of the, the DNA of the modern trade agreement, the General Agreement on Trade and Services. Actually, the DNA began probably 20 years prior, 30 years prior, um, during the efforts before and after World War I to create an international trade organization, which did not succeed. But um, the GATT was the aftermath of World War II, and so the GATT of 1947, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, 
It's still part of the WTO family of agreements. It's one of 18 basic agreements. Uh, and it's one of the ones that cover all 155 members of the World Trade Organization. The next stage of evolution was when the gap was expanded from just an agreement that covers trade and goods. And it was both an agreement and an institution, but it, the institution didn't have any teeth. It had no enforcement power if a country violated the rules of the gap. It was more of a debating society and a place in which countries threw around their diplomatic weight uh, rather than their uh, than use sanctions in the agreement. So the Uruguay round, which culminated in April of 1994, <coughs> created uh, the World Trade Organization as, a, as an institution, and it's a big one, uh, with most of its staff based in Geneva, Switzerland. It created the 17 other agreements, some of which apply to all members of the, of the WTO, and some of which apply just to the one, the coalition of the willing, so to speak, like procurement. Um, and the Uruguay round was notable because it made a radical leap forward beyond just regulating tariffs. Many, if not most, of these other agreements, for example, relating to services, intellectual property, technical barriers to trade, um, so-called sanitary and phytosanitary measures. These are all trade agreements that really regulate government, not trade. They regulate the way government regulates trade. And so that was the big innovation of the WTO agreements. A major encroachment on sovereignty, that's its purpose. So <coughs> governments got together and agreed to give some of their sovereignty to this shared body so that it could, in turn, limit them back. Uh, and the hoped for exchange was perhaps twofold. What is it they, the exchange of uh, trading sovereignty, so to speak, would, would produce benefits in terms of global growth overall? Uh, and that in particular, it would, um, what's the right word? It would take what used to look like tariff wars and, and turn them into um, a system of more legalistic dispute settlement and encourage countries to follow rules that regulate governments, that regulate trade. And here we are today. The current round of negotiations in the WTO, the Doha round, is pretty clearly stuck. And it's stuck for a lot of reasons, but among them is just simply that um, as new players in the WTO become economically powerful and start to use their power within the WTO, I'm talking about countries like China and India and Brazil, uh, Russia will soon exceed that is join the WTO. But these are big economies in their own right and they're flexing their muscle and they're, they're effective bargainers. And so uh, it's harder for the older players, like the United States and the European Union, to impose their will on everyone else. And so they, it's kind of ironic. As the WTO becomes more truly democratic as an institution, it's harder and harder for it to make deals. Countries' interests cancel each other out. And that's especially the case in agriculture in the current round of negotiations. And if there's no deal on agriculture, there's going to be no deal on services, which is what the United States cares about. And if there's no deal on services, the whole round is stuck, and that's where we are. So what you see instead is an alternative to that, where both the European <laughs> Union and the United States, among others, are pushing their own side deals, side trade agreements, either on a bilateral level, for example, the US-Korea agreement, or on a regional scale. So while the European Union is off negotiating what it calls economic partnership agreements, the United States is pushing its free trade agreements, FTAs. Procurement means purchase of goods or services by government. And oftentimes that takes the form of government buying a, simply buying a good. So you go out and buy a fire truck. But also sometimes it involves government setting up a contract in which they hire another, they hire a company to do their purchasing for them. So for example, most states that purchase food or big cities that purchase food um, no longer cook the food and they don't even buy it themselves anymore. They hire a broadline supplier, so they have a five-year contract, and that company buys the food for them. It's, it's almost like the way the Defense Department might procure enough food to feed an army. Well, if you have 40,000 kids in your school system, it's even more complicated than that. So uh, that's what I mean by procurement. And uh, as we'll talk a little bit later, it's become very controversial, the definition of procurement. Um, is something that 
it, something the government actually purchases to use for itself is obviously within the traditional sense of procurement. Paper clips, computers, microphones in front of us. Um, but what about government concessions that purchase food for the cafeteria? Government might be purchasing the food, but then they're reselling that food to employees of the government. So is that really procurement? Uh, or the University of Maine buys some textbooks or some equipment for the library, but the library then has a user fee, the students pay tuition. Is that resale of something that makes the government simply a proprietary actor in the marketplace and it's not procurement? There's a huge fight about that right now, and it matters a lot to states because it determines whether or not you're going to be held to trade rules or not. Uh, a service is anything you can't drop on your foot. Um, and what's interesting about services is almost no good, no bottle of water can be sold without the service of distribution of that water. And there's no reason for you to invest in a distribution supply chain, you know, the trucks and the <coughs> machine that puts it in the bottle and puts the cap on and puts it in a box and wraps it in plastic and gets it to a grocery store. And all that supply chain... None of that is worth a worthwhile investment unless you market the product. And the marketing only works if you have certain kind of marketing inputs from design and graphics to TV contracts. Or, so you see, goods and services overlap in the sense that goods can only be sold through services. And that pervades the entire economy. Up until now, we've thought about trade mostly in the old-fashioned GATT sense of trade. General, general agreement on uh, goods, essentially. Uh, very recently, governments and investors in the legal sense have started talking about trade in the, as services, where the chief service suppliers are companies from other countries, or subsidiaries of com companies from other countries. And the only thing that makes it international, frankly, is the ownership structure. We're at one of those moments where there's a shift occurring. We should all kind of look around us and pay attention. The WTO is stuck, and a lot of people are saying the WTO is dead, it's not going anywhere. That's hyperbole. The WTO is, was a major accomplishment. It, as I'll show you in a second, it created a real institutional function, and so it's not going anywhere. It's going to be there for a long, long time, doing what it does best, which is providing a forum to decide its own rules. It may well be stuck, perhaps permanently, with respect to negotiations, which are now shattering into lots of littler pieces, and the pieces are starting to coagulate. Uh, they're starting to pull together in bigger clusters. And so at this moment, there's a Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement on the table, and it's being negotiated by nine countries, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Uh, at the same time, that, not at the same time, many people think that the TPPA is really a reflection on the European Union. That is to say, the European Union is a free trade zone. It, it has, up until recently at least, been very successful in competing with the United States as a trade bloc. Now the United States wants to reestablish its old advantage by creating its own, I won't call it an empire, its own trade zone uh, that it can be a leader in, if not the leader, and that's the TPPA, the Trans-Pacific Region. And so there are two advantages to doing that. One is, by the time the TPPA done, it will be bigger than the European Union. So that's why the rules of the TPPA matter. The second big deal about it is that the EU is not part of it. So any argument you might have with the diplomats from Brussels who are protecting their own companies and making their own unique legal arguments, they're not even in the room. So that's a strategic move. That's, that's done on purpose, to avoid the European Union even being in the room so you can have <coughs> the whole trade agreement without European input. Okay, so that's enough about evolution, but you get the point. We're, we're, we're at a crucial moment where big shifts are happening, and the TPPA is, is uh, it's a paradigm. It's, it's a big deal. It's like one of those shifts. And in some ways, it's like power shifting away from the WTO, but the WTO is not leaving, so maybe it, you could think of it as accretion, the way snow piles on a glacier. It's, the old snow is always there, at least for a few centuries. So... Uh, Let's do a little geography. This might help you appreciate the point I just made. Um, I'll compare three different species of trade agreements. First, you've got the WTO agreements. Um, there are approximately 20 of them, depending on whether you count their governing documents as 
is an actual agreement. They cover trade disputes. They do not cover investment disputes. And what I mean by that is the difference between rules that apply to um, trade in goods or services as opposed to rules that apply to your ability to own an asset, um, your, your ownership interest as an investor. And under most investment agreements, private investors can bring their own claims. In a trade agreement, they can't. Only governments can bring claims. So governments, even if they have legal arguments they can use, sometimes they choose not to use them. Just out of respect for another country's sovereignty or because they agree on the policies at stake, um, I'm sure far fewer than half of the trade complaints that could be brought are. Now contrast that with free trade agreements. That's what we call them in the United States. The Europeans call them economic partnership agreements. So they kind of look the same. In fact, they're surprisingly similar. 20 some odd chapters, they do cover trade disputes. In some cases, they actually just incorporate or refer you back to the rules of the WTO and then add a few of their own. That's important because it means that these FTAs are like a laboratory there. It's where the diplomats and the trade negotiators are always thinking about, well, how could we improve on the WTO? And by improve on, what they mean is, how can we fulfill the wish list that's being given to us by everybody who's lobbying on this trade agreement? Um, in the United States free trade agreements, there is investor-to-state arbitration. There's a whole chapter that gives greater rights to foreign investors. The most important ones are procedural. They get their own tribunal outside of domestic courts. That's a big deal. Whereas in European uh, trade agreements, they don't have an investor state chapter. Why? Because the Europeans are way out ahead of us in terms of having their own bilateral investment treaties. There are 2,600 bilateral investment treaties in the world, and the European Union was out of the gate decades before the United States was, and I would say downright promiscuous in their, in their uh, efforts to uh, Sues countries into joining agreements with them, and they're starting to regret that because with 2,600 treaties, it's a huge mess legally. And it creates a forum for ongoing negotiations. Now compare that to the bilateral investment treaties, the BITs. A BIT is pretty much the same thing as the investment chapter of a trade agreement. And so the, for the United States, we have investment chapters in our 15 some odd trade agreements. We also have standalone investment treaties with some countries. There are 39 of them that are now in effect, with several that were actually negotiated but never ratified by the Congress. So that gives you a sense of the species of agreements that are out there. And I'll, I'll be referring to each kind in the following presentations. So if you plot where some of the most important investment treaties are, I've just put them up on the map. If you add the countries that are covered by current free trade agreements, I've just put them up on the map, and so you can see the pattern. There are some places on the planet that are just not covered by the U.S. commercial legal network. Africa, obviously. Russia, obviously. China. India. Not covered. Now comes the TPPA. Um, whoops, I skipped one. I, I don't know if you just saw the dot I just put up, but it's Panama. I had to do that separately because Panama is negotiated but not ratified yet by Congress. There's um, a lot of uh, conversations still going about how, on about how Panama regulates its banks. And I'll avoid the temptation to talk about that. <laughs> and then now comes the TPPA, which is interesting because you'll notice that it overlaps some countries we already have trade agreements with. Uh, and it, I'll just respond to your point by making a contrast. Some trade rules are relative. It's like, how does my country treat your country? Um, do I treat your investors no less favorably than I treat my own? So there are principles of discrimination. And when you hear US trade negotiators talk about trade agreements, they invariably say, this is all about a level playing field. Well, they're right, it is about a level playing field, but that's not what it's all about. <clears throat> so non-discrimination is what I call a relative treatment rule. How do you treat other countries and their goods and services and investors relative to your own? But then you have a whole different set of rules that I would call absolute. And so by absolute, what I'm talking about 
I'm talking about here is a rule that doesn't care about whether you're discriminating. In fact, there are rules that apply to measures that are not discriminatory. So you can be treating a foreign investor exactly like you'd be treating your own investor, okay? But still violate the rule. So that's why the rule for compensating investors when you expropriate their investments is a big deal because it goes far beyond this notion that we're just creating a level playing field. It's really like constitutional law. It's the international versions of takings. And it has a huge impact that governments have to pay every time they adopt a law that might regulate them. And that's why the rule on expropriation is so controversial. It's absolute, it has not to do with discrimination. It's constitution-like because it's so vague. What's an expropriation? Well, we've had a Supreme Court that has spent a century or more de determining through case law, you know, case after case after case, what that taking is. And yet an expropriation is like a taking, but it's something else. But the, the panels that decide what it means are ad hoc. There's no rule of precedent uh, in international investment law. And so Al can follow the previous cases or ignore them as it wants. It turns, it turns making decisions on these disputes into kind of a roulette game. And in that kind of indeterminate environment, it's difficult as a legislator to know whether a law you're about to pass is going to violate a trade agreement or not. Because you have people, you have lawyers coming in from both sides saying it is a violation, it's not a violation. And they both have logical arguments. And that's because the rules were drafted intentionally to be vague. Yeah. Can, can you give us a specific example of that? You, you're being taped now for main public broadcast. And, uh, you know, how, how, would you, oh, sorry. How, how would you explain to the people of Maine it's not working. The sound's what not the working. consequences are of what you just said? Um, you know, can you give us an example on how that would play out here in Maine? Well, oh, sure. Um, so the United States and 155 other countries have agreed to write what the director of the WTO once called an economic constitution for the world. Economic constitution for the world. That should scare you, right? So you've got the constitution you know and love, and you, you can pretty much know what the words mean because after 200 years of constitutional law, we've kind of worked out the kinks. We may not like the Supreme Court's decisions in certain areas, but we know pretty well where it is, and so now it's all about you know, the edge, the cutting edge of change, where the Supreme Court has a lot of power, but it, it always has to worry about precedence, because even if judges would like to overturn a law, they're, they're gonna try to avoid doing so, unless, um, they're gonna try to avoid doing so for at least for the reason that they, they want to remain consistent with precedence. In this new global economic constitution, the WTO family of agreements, and you could add to that all these other agreements, the 2,600 bilateral investment treaties, which are constitutional, 2,600, and they're all connected by treaty shopping provisions, which we can talk about later. And then the US free trade agreements and the European free trade agreements, and now Brazil and China are out there negotiating free trade agreements. So everybody's adopting all these constitutions. And it's layered on top of your existing one. That makes the law very complicated, and it makes the law of a legislator at the national or state level um, kind of hard to fathom. It's, it's turned what used to be a fairly predictable, logical system into legal chaos. So I hope that's responsive to your question. Why? why it matters that we're layering and layering all this new international law on top of our existing law. And again, I have to stress, this is not about tariffs and regulating trade anymore only. Now it's also about layer of layer of layer of limits on government power, some of which layers are inconsistent with each other and most of which are different from, if not actually contradictory to, what we think of as U.S. constitutional law. So, I'll close this answer with a specific example. In the period of 1880 to 1936, the U.S. Supreme Court was famous for what was called the Lochner era. Lochner was a Supreme Court case written by a judge named Rufus Peckham. Linda's smiling because she read this case in law school, I'm sure. Um, in which the Supreme Court held that a New York State law that regulates the working hours of bakers, 
who were working in front of these furnaces all day long. I forget what the limit was, but there was a limit on how many hours you could work per week, and the Supreme Court overturned it under a well-established doctrine that it was an interference with what the court defined at the time was rights and contract. And the court said, this law interfered with the relationship between employee and master. That was the attitude of the court at the time. Well, with the Roosevelt era court and the famous switch of, of values by one of the key justices, the switch in time to save nine, if you recall from history books, um, the Supreme Court turned and reversed that presumption. And since 1936 or so, the presumption in U.S. law is that when the legislature of Maine, the legislature of New York adopts a law, the court should not second guess it unless it really tramples on a fundamental right or is clearly discriminatory against other states or foreign commerce. In those circumstances, you, you will be subject to strict scrutiny. The judges will look beneath and over and above your legislation to see whether it's really necessary, whether it's really more restrictive than it needs to be. Otherwise, um, if it's just economic regulation, the courts are gonna defer to you. They're not gonna second guess you. 